we'll go ahead and uh, get things started with the next session here. Uh, welcome, as Dan said, to the 2018 Event Partner Summit. Uh, my name is Grant Cox. I'm the chairman of the Game Design Committee, and so Dan did a really good job of talking about kind of the mission and the vision of the foundation and where you know STEM is heading in the future and all that fun stuff. Um, I am going to dive immediately right down into the weeds, and we're going to start talking about rules and we're going to start talking about fields and uh, different things there. So. Uh, last year was my first time doing this presentation at the EP Summit, um, and I really had a good time with it. We, we had some great discussions. Uh, we found some pretty big issues with the game, and uh, we are able to fix them for the August update. So I'm looking forward to that type of conversation here again um, with you all. Um, like I mentioned, uh, my name is Grant Cox. I started as an FRC competitor when I was in high school. Uh, I've been volunteering at Vex World since 2009, um, and this is my going to be my second season as the chairman of the, the committee. Uh, so the committee works really hard on getting the, a game out there that may, meets the goals of both VEX and the REC Foundation, uh, that is fun to play, uh, that is playable by, we like to say, the middle 80% of teams, um, that you know, by most teams can score points and, and have some fun, uh, and is engaging for an audience. So the committee is made up of kind of a cross-platform group of people. Um, Lisa, Corey, Dylan, you guys want to raise your hand? So we have a couple people from the REC Foundation. Um, you can chat with them during the breaks if you'd like. Uh, we also have a couple engineers from VEX, as well as somebody from RoboMatter to get some programming uh, stuff in there as well. So that's kind of the background on me and the committee. And this is Turning Point. Uh, so we have a lot, I have a lot of stuff to get through. Uh, and uh, so we will have some time for questions, but you can also use those question cards that Dan was talking about. Um, most of the slides are just going to be like pictures from the manual uh, because we, we really took a fresh look at the manual this year and tried to answer as many questions as would come up in the manual as possible. Uh, we will have some time to talk about specifics of the field. There are definitely some quirks, there are definitely some EPs that when this field was unveiled went, what is wrong with you guys? Uh, <laughs> So we're going to talk about that, and then we will close with some quick notes on V5 and VEXU. Um, so we'll start with the and the video, because the video uh, answers kind of a lot of the overarching how the game works questions. And if we don't have volume, then I might just do the voiceover for y'all. All right, that's fine. Uh, so it's played on a 12 by 12 field. Uh, two alliances, red and blue. Um, you score points by uh, parking on platforms, flipping caps, and flipping toggles uh, with balls. Flipping flags with balls. A cap on the lower on the ground is worth one point. They can be flipped back and forth. Um, the caps are nine inches in diameter, and you can only hold one at a time. Uh, again, low scored is worth one point. High scored is worth two points. Uh, high scored is placed up on the post, and we'll talk about that in more detail during the session. The other half of the game, or the other third of the game, is the flags. The flags can also be either blue or red. The bottom row is considered the low flags, and the top two rows are both considered the high flags. Um, one point for the low row, two points for the highs. The flags can only be toggled by balls, uh, but you can only hold two balls at a time. The platforms are the final element of the game. Uh, big king of the hill thing in the middle of the field. We're super excited about this. Uh, the alliance platform is worth three points. It can only be used by your color, alliance. And the center platform is worth six points and can be used by either alliance. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> uh, there are eight caps on the field, six posts, and nine flags, and uh, 27 balls. Something like that. I can't remember the exact number. Um, I can't remember what's talking about here. Oh, the, you know, the match is a minute 45 long. It starts with 15 seconds of autonomous mode. Um, yeah, it starts with 15 seconds of autonomous mode. Uh, we'll talk about the autonomous mode in more detail um, and that autonomous line and how that uh, plays in to the rules here. Autonomous bonus is worth four points. And you can't use a controller. And I think the rest of it is pretty straightforward. Scores will be added up at the end of the match, like all other Vex games. And for more information, visit robotevents.com, vexrobotics.com, and roboticseducation.org.
All right. So yeah. So in this so in this session, I'm going to focus mainly on the things that are either new for Turning Point or you know the game specifics because you're all experienced. You know what a starting position is. You know what a uh, uh, you know matches are scored at the end of the match and all that. Um, so the first thing is the caps. So the theme, the overall theme for this game is back and forth. That was kind of what we wanted to go for in all aspects of the field. So the caps have a red side and a blue side. As you saw in the video, they can either be low score, which is on the uh, foam tiles, um, or high score, which is up on the posts. We had to figure out how to quantifiably say which color is up. Um, and so we came up with the idea of calling it the core, uh, this center uh, cylinder piece here. So if the core is contacting the foam tiles, then it's considered low score. If it's vertical and the core is not touching anything, then it's not scored. This shouldn't be very common, but it does happen, I've heard, so, um, so that does not count as score. And then if it's up on a post that's worth two points, that's considered high score. Um, flags, same thing. Uh, we wanted to do whichever color is facing outwards, but we needed a quantifiable way to say that. And so we had a we, we came up with this pointer and detent idea. Um, so how many how many of you have built a field and have had a chance to play with the elements yourselves? Okay, awesome, most of you. So you've seen the little pointers. Then um, a third of the flags start nested, nested in the detent so that they're neutral. Uh, a third count starts scored as red. A third starts scored as blue. Um, you've seen as you're playing with them, they 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 don't tend to go back to neutral. They tend to stay in a scored position to a scored position. So it should be fairly obvious uh, in most cases. Um, the flags are actually reversible. So this is something that uh, was brought up on the forums. I wanted to make sure all the EPs saw it. So as these are toggling back and forth, obviously you're going to have some amount of wear on that pointer. Uh, that is expected. So there's actually two pointers. There's one on the top and one on the bottom. So if you're the type of EP that runs like 10, 15 events, um, halfway through you can just uh, flip the Lexan flags and flip them over. Um, the support piece that includes the detent is, al is also reversible. So between those two reversible elements, you should definitely have no issues as the season goes with them wearing down. Uh, there's also a rare condition that really is only doable with your hands, but if you flip it out past the support structure like this, it is possible to do, um, but it should not be done, so this is not worth any points. Um, and if a robot's really trying to do that as a way to descore, uh, they haven't thought the game through. So. so that's the flags. And I am burning through the scoring stuff pretty quickly because, again, it's pretty straightforward. We'll, we'll spend more time on the, the field and stuff like that. Um, parking. So parking is a really exciting element in this game. Um, we've wanted to do like a King of the Hill or something for a long time. Um, we've, uh, we've, wanted to, we've wanted to do terrain for a long time. And so we found a way, the engineers found a way to do these platforms in a way that were safe, uh, robust, and uh, still a challenge for the teams. Um, parking in, on your Alliance platform uh, it has to be touching the Alliance platform and not touching the field tiles or and, uh, not touching the field tiles. Pretty straightforward. Um, if you're on your Alliance platform, you're still protected under G12, so you can't get harassed and you can't get knocked off. Um, there's no other provisions with parking. There's no comments about if it's contacting a game object or if it's contacting other robots or if there are multiple robots up there or if you're contacting your, alliance, your opponent's Alliance platform. It's just what you see. Uh, center parked is the... Oh, my picture's are backwards. Uh, center, center parked is the center platform. Uh, same rules apply, except now you can't be touching an Alliance platform, and you have waived your uh, protection under G12, and I have a whole slide on that. But the idea there is we want some interaction, we want teams to be kind of competing for that center platform. The autonomous line. Uh, so this is something that we've also wanted to do for a long time, uh, and, and we're able to get into this game. Um, so I don't think Dan talked about it too heavily, but one of the directions that uh, the, the RDC is, is going is, is more focused on coding, more focused on AI. Um, and so it, as far as the games are concerned, right now we're at like, 
maybe 20% of teams even attempting the autonomous. And, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but one of the reasons, frankly, is because you know the, there's not as much, uh, th there's a little bit of fear on the field that you might mess something up, or you might run into the opponent, or they might run into you, or you know, there, there's, there's a little bit of nerves there. So we split the field in half and said, don't mess with your opponent's autonomous. Um, one of, the, one of the GDC members, uh, a guy named Chuck Glick, he used to be a VEX competitor and a VEX U coach, um, and we call it the anti-Chuck Glick line, because he used to design his autonomous modes to drive straight across the field and hit the opponent. And we don't want that anymore. <laughs> so, um, so with the autonomous line, uh, it's not a vertical plane. Nothing in this game is vertical infinite planes. It's all contact. So it's all, it's, so with the autonomous line, you can, if you're hanging over it, that's okay, that's maybe a warning, uh, but if you contact the foam tiles, or a robot, or their alliance platform, or any of that stuff, then the auton bonus immediately goes to the other alliance. Most times, you shouldn't even have to worry about this, because, again, teams are going to be focusing on either shooting at flags, or doing things on their side of the line. Um, expansion, okay, expansion's a weird one this year. Um, because we have vertical things that they have to be able to score on, but then you have vertical shooting goals that they you don't want them to block. So we'll start with horizontal. Horizontal is exactly the same as last year. That was the hot topic at the ESP Summit last year, was um, is it horizontal line to line, or is it a cylinder, or is it anything weird like that? Um, the horizontal line to line seems to be pretty universally um, understood now, especially now that all EPs have the sizing tool um, and anybody can use a yardstick. Uh, it's 36 inches in any horizontal dimension. Um, that is also roughly the size of the diagonal of a foam tile, so you can kind of get a rough estimate there in the middle of a match. For vertical sizing, um, you have the expansion zone, and I don't have a picture top down of the field, but if you've built a field, you've seen the expansion zone. Basically, if you're contacting that expansion zone, you can go vertical as much as you want, if you're outside of the expansion zone, which is not contacting the expansion zone, you have to bring it back down. Uh, this is a rule, and we're gonna be working on the ref training videos very soon here. Uh, this is a rule that has quite a bit of gray area. This is a rule that has, it's gonna be open to some interpretation. Uh, there's gonna be teams that maybe as they're coming out of the expansion zone, they're retracting down. That's okay, we're generally gonna be, you know, that's generally okay, um, it's if you actually affect gameplay. If you're, if as you're coming down you block a ball, or if, you know, you have to extend upwards in, toward, in order to accomplish a task, that's when it becomes a violation. Um, and as with all things uh, in, in roughing and VEX, uh, very liberal with the warnings and the cautions and educating teams that, hey, you were pretty close to being too, too tall there, you know, watch it next time. Um, and if we have more questions about this, I imagine this will be a topic during the referee and Q&A tomorrow as well. Um, okay, keep game objects on the field. So this is another one, if you've got goals around the outside of the field, and teams can remove objects from them, you're probably going to have some objects accidentally fall outside the field. So this is one that uh, we do recognize is probably going to be a little bit of a strain on refs and, and EPs. Um, you just got to watch for them. Make sure that you have corner refs uh, you know, at the front corners. Uh, basically the rule here is if your cap falls outside of the field, which is most commonly going to happen when they're de-scoring, then the referee returns it to the field, nearest foam tile, low scored for the opposite alliance than was the one that knocked it out. Um, if it's too close to call, you know, if it's a, in basketball, if it's a jump ball, uh, then the cap just stays outside the field. Um, the goal here is to de-incentivize teams, you know, just knocking them out of the field with, with reckless abandon. Um, if you see a team doing that repeatedly, then you can DQ them for that. And balls that leave the field uh, don't get returned because uh, you don't need to go chasing balls down in the middle of the game. Uh, the net does a pretty good job of bouncing them back, but sometimes teams don't know what they're doing. Okay, G12. Uh, so G12 is the don't kill other teams rule. Uh, we we kind of reformatted it a little bit this year. We kind of split it up. Uh, we split the offensive teams get the benefit of the doubt into its own rule. Um, really trying, to, especially after some of the discussions and the you know heated feedback from last season, uh, we wanted to try and make this a little bit more clear. Um, in, in general, 
team is responsible for the actions of your robot. Don't you know be reckless and you know create robot destroying mechanisms. But at the same time, understand that it is an interactive game. There are really no protected zones on this field. Like it is, it is intended to be some some defense. The big item is, of course, the center platform. So the center platform is a essentially an acknowledgement that I'm ready to play rough. Like I'm going up there, I am prepared for anything that the other alliance wants to throw at me. Um, and so as a referee, you gonna like you have to train your referees to kind of uh, keep teams calm, but let them play. Like let them play. Um, the only time when this become when when a center platform violation could go too far is if it is turning into intentional damage. You know, I, I we we're all BattleBots fans here, right? But not on the Vex playing field. Uh, and, and and that can actually be solved with R three as well, saying you can't have destructive mechanisms on your robot. So. Uh, if you have a hammer, if you have a sharp edge, if you have those types of mechanisms, that's when it goes too far. However, if you're just scuffling in a pushing match um, and you fall off and you break, that's an acknowledgement of the risk. And, and we're still working on figuring out the exact verbiage to define where that line is, um, but it's kind of a you know it when you see it type thing, um, and this will be a referee judgment call, so the refs will just have to be trained on it, um, watch the matches and understand where the line is. DQs, all right. How many of you noticed that we changed DQ rules this year? All right, that's about as many as I expected. Uh, so this was kind of buried in the tournament section and I wanted to make sure we made it uh, very clear and very known. Um, so in the past, if a team was DQ'd, um, the opposing alliance still got the loss, right? And remember that DQs and VEX mostly happen for match affecting violations. And so, by that logic, you are admitting that a rules violation caused an alliance to lose, but they're still going to lose. Like, this was one of the biggest heartbreaks for teams. This is one of the things that anybody who's had ref an event um, you know, has dealt with. Uh, it was a very difficult scenario. So this year we changed it so that, in the, essentially, if you get a DQ, the opposing alliance gets the win, quote unquote. And there's specific verbiage that explains what that means, but that's essentially where it lies. So I have an example here, again, to explain it. So you've got your, got your match, two red, two blue. Um, and it all comes down to win points. So the win points are the first thing that rank the teams. It's essentially your two points for a win, one point for a tie, and zero points for a loss. Under the old system, or under both systems, when you win, you get two win points. When you lose, you get zero win points. Under the old system, if you got a DQ, you got zero win points. Your opponent still got zero win points, and your partner got two win points, because we didn't want to punish the randomly uh, paired uh, partner. This is assuming, this is talking about qualifiers. Uh, this is a terrible scenario for the Blue Alliance, right? Because with the, with the match affecting DQ, you're acknowledging that, like using last year's example, you're acknowledging that Red knocked over one of Blue's stacks, but Blue is still gonna lose. Um, so under the new system, uh, DQ team still gets zero, their partner still gets two because you still can't penalize the randomly paired partner, um, and then the opposing alliance gets two as well. So we ran some simulations on this. We took a look at some events uh, that had you know an amount of DQs, and we we, had, we ran a bunch of different scenarios. Like, what if they got one? What if they got you know a certain amount? What if we changed it? And with this method, um, the only teams that are impacted in the overall rankings end up being the two blue teams and they end up getting bumped up a little bit. Um, it's exactly the same for the DQ teams, exactly the same for the partners, and it's actually exactly the same for most of the other teams in the rankings. Um, so this is a change that, that really benefits uh, the Blue Alliance in these scenarios. Okay, uh, moving on to the, some robot rules. Actually, one robot rule. Uh, most of the robot rules are the same this year, except for V5, which has its own slide. Uh, but there's a big change that we started rolling out at the Vex Worlds, and it's now really becoming uh, important in the game manual itself. Uh, we're taking a hard line on what, what is colloquially known as plate swapping. Taking a hard line on teams building one robot for the A team, then the A team qualifies for states, and then they give it to the B team. The B team uses their robot and qualifies for states, and then they give it to the C team. C team qualifies with that robot and then qualifies for states. 
Like, this completely defeats the purpose of the program, completely defeats the purpose of the design process that Dan talked about. Um, so we changed up the verbiage of R1 a little bit and added this big giant wall of text to, to give event partners and RSMs and referees a little bit more guidance and uh, verbiage and messaging and background as to um, how to uh, identify this and how to call a team out for it. Um, at the end of the day, is it you know is it is it uh, going to be 100 percent easy to enforce? No, probably not. Um, at the end of the day, are you going to catch every single team that does it? No, probably not. We don't have a database of photos of every robot, and you know we don't serial serialize every screw that goes on every robot. Um, but at least the goal here was to provide the intent, provide the messaging, so that now you as event partners have something to lean back on uh, if if you have these teams exhibiting this bad behavior. All right, so. That was pretty much all I'm going to talk about, or all I have prepared about the game rules. Um, because again, I, like I said, I want to blitz through it and not focus on anything that changed. Any questions about the rules uh, themselves thus far that you don't want to put on a card? Yeah? Just real quick, last year I put on a tournament, it was my first one, and one team showed up, came, registered, did everything, and didn't have something that they needed and couldn't find the cart anywhere, and they just left which means everybody that was paired up with them was disqualified. How can well, we accommodate the rules for that? They, they should have been disqualified. They should have, they, they probably lost the match uh, because they were only played with one. Uh, they should have counted as a no-show. Um, so a no-show technically does not count as the same as a disqualification. Um, you, I believe you get zero win points. Uh, I can't remember for sure. Uh, but under the new system, it doesn't cause the like the opposing lines gets two win points thing. Um, the other thing too is is and some of the REC people can speak to this a little bit more clearly than I can. But depending on when you find this out, rerunning a schedule is an option. Uh, it's not a great option uh, depending on how many printed copies are floating around there, but it is an option. Um, but yeah, the, their partners should should not be penalized for that. I don't believe so. It's a very rough situation to be in. Um, and of course, we try to support teams as everybody. Hey, does anybody have an extra battery? Or you know, but that's that's rough that that team just left you left to hang it. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good question. So he had for people who couldn't hear uh, for the, the center platform G12. You know, I'm ready to go play. When does that really come into when does that really come into effect? Uh, could a team claim that I was just chilling on the alliance platform and, and I wasn't you know actually playing? Uh, some of this comes down to referee judgment call. Uh, it's going to be kind of similar to last year in the five point zone where you had to determine if a team was trying to go score or if they were just trying to get in the way. Um, the easy route is if it's if there's any contact, uh, you know. But obviously in the heat of the moment, sometimes that's harder to see. Um, I would, I would, if, if I was in that case with where I was the referee and I was, you know, talking to a team who was involved up there, um, I would say, listen, if you didn't want to be involved in that, you should have planted, you should have sat back, you shouldn't have even been close to it, right? The alliance platforms are there for a reason. Uh, now that being said, uh, if you know if a team is planted on the alliance platform and there is a scuffle happening in the center and two teams are going back and forth and like the, the team that's planted on the platform kind of gets caught in the crossfire, um, that's when you might go, you might say, hey, maybe like there should be a G12 somewhere in there because this team, this team did nothing wrong. This team was trying to just play, you know, sit by themselves over here. Um, that's not a great answer, but because it is kind of a super, uh, there's no blanket, an it is impossible to provide a blanket answer when, based on a snapshot of a hypothetical match type question. How many times have I written that? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yes. That's a good question, uh, and we actually debated about this quite a bit on the GDC. Um, but there was a Q and A asked about this. Um, uh, so, 
Essentially, you, by sitting up there, you have waived your protection under G12. It doesn't go the other way, right? So that team that's down there doesn't even, they don't need to be engaging with the center platform. You're up there, you're saying I'm a pinata, like I'm fair game. So, so the videos that you're talking, I think you're talking about Singapore, right? Um, that had the little pushers, that is legal. Uh, so a team that's on the ground can uh, if affect a team that's up on the center platform. Uh, no, because that, that if that team is not engaging with the center platform, like it's it, it's the the team that's not trying to get up there. Like if a team is clearly unable to even come close to getting up there, and they just have a ram bar and they're just trying to push you off, um, then under, as it's currently written and as that Q and A was currently answered, um, it doesn't go both ways, right? They they do not they still have the protection, so you up there can't really damage them. Again, you gotta you gotta play it by how like the context of the specific match. Um, G12 still exists, right? So if you damage a robot that's down there, if you have like a thwacker arm or something, you can still be penalized for that. Um, but you up there, if you get damaged, then you're not pe then the other team isn't penalized. Does that make sense? <laughs> it's it's the team who's up there is fair game to damage. Teams who are not up there. Still have protection, essentially. Yeah. Um, earlier, you said that during uh, during autonomous, you can't cross that double southern line, but you also said that, that that's not a vertical plane. Correct. If you park on the the yellow section, the yellow parking section during our autom autonomous and get a point. Uh, so there, there is another part of that rule that says you cannot become center parked. Um, so you, yeah, you don't get any points for it, um, and you you can't get up there. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah, because again, it, it, it's it's related to the team that is parked up there. Uh, the team that is on the center platform is fair game for you know, heavy interaction, heavy damage, and everything. Uh, the regardless of like what else they're they're sticking out or whatever, the team who's trying to get up there, they're just trying to get on their alliance platform. The team that's on the center platform. They've waived their protection, right? So if they get knocked off by anybody, doesn't matter if a team's on their alliance platform, if they're on the ground, that's okay. Yeah? Can two robots share a platform? Yes. Thank you. Yeah. So, so that's that's the change that was made this year. Um, so I, I, I should have said it in a little bit more um, detail. So this and in this year's game manual, it's expanded out to multiple events. Um, so that part C there says that uh, once a robot has competed under a given team number, it is their robot. No other teams may compete with it for the duration of the season. Um, and so that's something that would get caught should get caught in inspection, and that team would just be disqualified from the tournament. Uh, they would not be allowed to compete. The the B team. Yeah. So multiple copies is a little bit of a gray area here. Um, under under the rule currently, um, it's it's having to do with physical components. Uh, I, I kind of have the colloquial term in the red box. If you can put the two robots on a table next to each other, then they are two robots. Um, so copies don't necessarily always mean that the design process wasn't followed. It's possible that this this group of ten students split across two teams. Collaborated to develop the best, you know, possible design. Uh, so that's that's generally going to be a bit uh, permissible. So uh, we'll do these two, and then I got I got do have to move on. So you first. Mm -hmm. Correct. Uh, at the end of the match, if a red and a blue robot are on the center platform together, they both get points. 
Can an event partner implement a photo uh, process as we had at Worlds this year? That is a good question. Uh, there are there are no rules preventing this, um, but I, you would you may run into the issue of a team that you know uh, this isn't sanctioned. Uh, you know this show me show me in the rules where this is allowed. Let let's we'll discuss that. Uh, we'll take that down as as one of our notes um, and either make a post about that or, or get back to you. Our, our goal, like long, long term, would, would be for that to be available, that system to be available to all event partners and, and have a database, but we're not there yet. All right, so let's talk about this field. So those of you who built the field, uh, you saw that it did come with uh, printed instructions. Um, now we're gonna be doing this for the forever. This was like a number one point of feedback that everybody gave and um, we just needed to do it. So um, I'm gonna walk through a few of the key points that uh, are important for event partners to keep in mind. Um, first is the tape lines. How many of you, when you build your field, put the platforms down before putting the, pla the tape lines down? I know some REC people did, so uh, just follow the, the written instructions. It has the tape lines first for a reason, because if you put the platforms down, then you won't be able to put the tape down in the center. Um, the, the also the position of the expansion zone tape lines is actually kind of important depending on if a team has developed like an autonomous routine or uh, has some other um, element of the robot that really depends on the pos exact positioning of that white tape line. Make sure you're on the correct side of the tabs as they're called out in the uh, in the instructions. Platform position. I already heard one person comment on this when they came in. Uh, so. Uh, the platform is not centered. Sorry. Uh, so the, there was a number of constraints that led the, that were involved in this type of design. Uh, we have a certain type of plate that goes under the field that we really like to use. We didn't want to redesign. Uh, we wanted the components in the platform to be all modular, right? You, you can't have like a left side bracket and a right side bracket. Uh, that's just too complicated. And we also wanted it to be as robust and, and as, as possible. And so. Um, with these constraints, we ended up with the problem that because of the even number of field tabs on the field tiles, it, it couldn't be perfectly centered without drilling a hole in your field tiles, which we really didn't want to do. That's an immovable constraint. So if you follow the instructions as they're written, the platform will actually end up being one tile biased to the blue side, I believe. Um, that's just the way it's going to be. Teams should be prepared for that variance. Um, everything in the field appendix and the game manual, everything talks about being one inch plus or minus. Um, and, and also, again, this is this is public knowledge. It's in the field appendix. It's in the, the build instructions. All events should have their platforms placed in the exact same place. So teams should be prepared for that. Post clamps. These guys uh, are, are probably one of the more difficult parts of the field build, uh, just because they are very tight. Uh, the, the reason for them being so robust and so tight, our constraint was that uh, the, the PVC pipe should break before the clamp does, because the pipe is easier to replace. Uh, so if, you, if any of you have any like PVC pipes, you can actually bend it all the way over uh, and the clamps won't break. Uh, my big tip for these would be to, you know, if you nest, nest the nuts down into the little pockets, uh, before you mount it there, there is a, there's actually a certain rotation of the nut that fits in the pocket a little bit better than other rotations. So you, you might just have to play with these a little bit uh, before, before getting them on there. The good news about these is that once they're on once, you never have to take them off for the rest of the season. Uh, so they are kind of a pain the first time, I totally admit that and, and I acknowledge that. Uh, but once they're on once, then you can leave them on your, your walls for the rest of the season, even if you're taking the field up and down. I'm sorry? What was I actually have a few slides on that specifically, so good question. Um, the flag towers. So these guys, uh, uh, you, when you open the, the kit, you see that you have a couple orange pipes in there that look a little different. Uh, those are specifically intended to space out the flags. Um, that, the first step, where is it? On the top left where you have to use some of those brackets to kind of level the thing, uh, the, the mount, can be a little bit weird. We really had a hard time putting this in writing, what we meant here. The goal is just keep everything level, keep everything at the same heights that it's supposed to be, 
um, and you should be good to go. Uh, it's, it's a little convoluted in the instructions, but if you just take your time, um, you really should have no issues with the flag towers. And then the net. Um, so there are, I'm going to talk specifically about attaching the net first, and then we're going to talk about storing the net uh, later. Um, there are six pages of the field instructions dedicated to how you attach the net to the field. Um, a lot of people, a lot of people, myself included, the first time you build a field, you're like, all right, I got all these posts up, I got this net, I'm just going to zip tie it around, and it's good to go. Um, and what ends up happening, if you don't follow the specs that are provided in the instructions or in the field appendix, you'll end up with like dead spots in the net, or you'll end up with loose spots, or the balls might not get captured, captured at the bottom. Um, we really do advise you know, following the guidelines that are in the, the instructions. There's certain places around the top that will make it more robust. The Using the field attachment feet at the bottom is, is a huge must, um, and using the correct amount of them is a huge must. Um, the question came up on the Q&A about uh, slack in the net. The, there is some manufacturing variance in the net. Um, this is mainly just due to the fact that they're, I think they're like three inch, uh, no, like two or two and a half inch um, pitch, like uh, holes. So your, your variance could essentially be anywhere in that two and a half inches, depending on where it gets cut at the factory. So there may be some that are looser than others. Um, that is okay, that is expected. Teams should be prepared for this variance. Um, the exact question that was posted was, if I do have a net that's extremely slack, um, can I, you know, cinch up one row of the holes and like, you know, attach it a little bit tighter? Feel free to do so. Um, feel free to, you know, make it however you feel looks right. Um, what we really don't want is balls like getting uh, stuck in the bottom. Uh, but if you keep it tight, you shouldn't have that problem. Um, also, the net, if it gets damaged, if you get like a hole in it um, and you need to uh, recover it with some gaffer tape or something, that's totally fine. And then somebody brought up this guy. So uh, this has not had an official Q&A posted yet, but it, uh, it's going to be part of the ref training videos, um, and it will be, like this, is, this will be an official statement. Um, these, so at the top corners of the net, you're using these brackets that attach the pipes to each other. Um, these brackets are designed so that they're all the same, and so that you can, you know, uh, use them throughout. Uh, we're going to go ahead and allow, like, if you if you one of them cracks or if you want to replace it with an off-the-shelf PVC connector, um, you can, so long as it doesn't affect the performance of the net, which an off-the-shelf PVC connector probably shouldn't affect the performance of the net. Okay, so now this is to this gentleman's questions here. We do have some tips for storing and moving the field. Um, first, like I mentioned, uh, the post clamps can stay on the field walls. They're, most of the walls are the same, the clamp is right in the center, and then a few of them are offset, so you just keep track of which one's which. Um, the platforms can stay together, but we recommend not keeping them together as an assembly, like all three of them. Keep them as separate, you know, red, blue, yellow platforms. Um, the connection in the middle, like it could get bent a little, they're just bolts. Again, you've built it, you, you know what it looks like. Uh, highly recommend not leaving that together. Uh, and then the flag towers can pretty much be left intact um, in, in their full uh, build. And I have a whole slide on the net itself. So, uh, again, we knew the net was going to be a challenge for event partners, but we really, really wanted it as a key part of this game. Um, so we have a couple things, a couple tips, and a couple recommendations for storing the net. The first one is if you're, if you're Josh uh, and you've got you know, a 12-foot trailer, uh, you can actually fold the sides, like the side uh, wings in, and store that entire back wall as one section, including the flag towers, and including the net, including the, the uprights. Um, it, it's, it's robust enough that you should be able to do that, just carry it with like three people. Uh, that's the easiest and the most recommended way. Um, if you don't have quite that much space, you can detach the sides and then detach the vertical members and you can actually fold the horizontal members, the top members, in on themselves and roll it all up like that. Um, so this will keep it generally together and generally attached in the same place, though you will still have some uh, assembly on site, especially with the towers. And then if you're limited on space, uh, detach everything. Uh, we highly recommend marking the corners of the field, of the net. Uh, the, the, if you mark the corners with like a, a white tape or something, that's the easiest way to locate it when you go back to build it again. 
Um, and then you can roll the net around like a pipe from last year or one of the, the vertical PVC posts. Um, this is, I believe, what the REC actually does with their trailer fields. They, they, they roll them around in the, in the zone, five-point zone pipe, uh, and it works really well to keep the net from tangling um, or, or getting torn or anything like that. Questions about field, yeah. I'm writing that down, I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. Uh, so she asked if the balls have um, like pinholes in them to account for pressure changes at different elevations. Yeah, they, so the, the game objects that had those in the past were a different type of plastic than these, and it was a different manufacturing process, so it may not be an issue, but I, I'll ask the engineers, I, I don't feel confident getting an answer, but... Right, well, I don't know if there's any other any other manufacturing you know issues with that as well. I'll just talk to an engineer, we'll get back to you. Yeah. That question, I'm gonna push off to the Q&A. Uh, I'd like to answer that one publicly in a public forum. I did, I did say that at the beginning. Um, I'm open to questions during this session, but we do have the official Q&A forum for official answers that we want to get publicized to everybody. Um, that one I'm gonna have to, unfortunately, push you off to a Q&A. Yeah. Great question. So the recommended location is uh, so she asked, where do we mount the field timer display, uh, the monitor? Uh, the recommended location is in one of the front corners. Um, uh, I believe we recommend bias to the blue side. Um, this does bias it a little bit offset for one of the alliances. Um, it's a little bit more difficult for them to see. Um, so if you mount it there, we you know recommend having a, either another display or, or maybe uh, making it you know having another display somewhere that they can look at. We don't recommend putting it in the center because that'll block alliance uh, audience view of the center platform, which is one of the most important parts of the game. Um, depending on how your event is set up, that might be less of an issue than others. So like at the Greenville High School event, the fields are on the floor and the audience is all raised in bleachers. So that won't be as big of an issue for that. But if you have raised fields or if your audience is at the same level as the field, then we don't recommend putting it in the center. We didn't want to put it, but he asked, he said, what about behind the net? We didn't want to put it there because teams are shooting balls at it, and we heard enough complaints during Starstruck about teams stabbing monitors and breaking them. So that was why we don't recommend that. You're, you're welcome to do that. The, the field monitor placement is one of those things that is kind of at EP discretion. So I can say what we recommend, but if you, if you have a different route, feel free. All right, I will move on. I've got, oh, I'm right up against time here. Can I go for five more minutes? Yeah, all right. Because uh, we got hot topics. So first is V5. How many of you have been V5 beta testers or you had the opportunity to, to play with them? Okay, a couple. So uh, the first rule is that uh, the, the V5 beta components are not legal for competition use. Um, it's, it's stated in the rules, we added a rule in the June update that specifically states this. Um, the most obvious way that you'll be able to tell in inspection is the color. So the beta components are light gray, they're the ones on the left in the picture. Production components are black with red printing. Um, if, if, when you see them side by side, it's extremely obvious. Um, if there's ever any question, most of the beta hardware also has the words beta test stamped on them. The brains, the batteries, the motors, and the vision sensors, I think. Um, have beta test stamped on them, they're not legal for use. Uh, it's an unfair advantage to the teams who got it for free, the, diff the internals are different, like there's just there's a myriad of reasons why the beta U components are not legal. Um, the second is the field connection. This is a really, really common question. It came up at the EP Summit last year. It comes up every time somebody mentions the word V5. Um, the field connection is exactly the same as it has been for the Cortex controller, the VexNet joysticks. Um, a lot of EPs will not have to do anything extra or anything special to prepare their tournament manager or prepare their fields for V5 controllers. Um, it just connects exactly the same, same hardware, same signal, same everything. Um, we did add a pretty significant rule regarding the vision sensor. 
So we've never had machine vision in, in VEX before. We've never had to deal with cameras tracking you know, objects on a field. And so we added this rule that basically states that you can't attach a ball to the side of your robot and then use it to distract the teams who are trying to track balls. Um, this is a very, like, it's hard to write down every possibility for what this could mean. Um, it's gonna require a lot of kind of back and forth, uh, both from GDC side to see what things happen out there, but also from you all to work with your teams and say, hey, come on, your team logo is the flag. Like, can you please take it off your robot? You know, and by definition, non-functional decorations, you shouldn't have a problem with asking a team to remove that because it shouldn't affect the function of their own robot. So, yeah. So that's that's where we're gonna have to see. So if you're if you've got like a yellow you know uh, wheel on the side of your robot or something, it's really gonna have to come down to if it uh, if impacts the team's gameplay. So you'll see something that's on the field as well. Like if a team whose team color happens to be yellow is like strafing in front of the flags, you know, during autonomous or something, like it's pretty clear that they're doing that. Whereas if they're just playing the game, it's pretty clear that they're not. Um, I, I'll be honest, I don't have a firm 100% answer on this yet because we've got to kind of see how it goes. But the rule is in there, the intent is in there, um, and so we'll, we'll uh, watch that. Um, one note, one additional note for event partners, I want to show the uh, lighting does impact this a little bit. Is this my lighting demo? I think it is, yeah. So this is, this is a video of, the, um, of what the vision sensor utility actually sees. And so what I've got here is I've got two nothing or two turning point balls that the vision sensor has been uh, calibrated to see, and then I have one of our interns shining a flashlight on it and shining some different colored lights on it. And so you'll actually see that the lighting conditions as they change do impact what a vision sensor is able to see. It, it recognizes it as a different color. Um, I think in this one they, they shine the blue light, yeah, and it goes completely away with a different lighting condition. So what this means is that for events that have like big fancy show lighting or you know anything that changes from practice to competition time, um, you either will have to A, use the same lighting during practice as you do during competition, or B, allow calibration time for teams, um, either in the morning, right after inspection, or something like that. And I think the REC is working on putting together some more specific di guidelines on how to implement that in your schedule, but just be aware that that's coming. I think that was my last slide. Oh no, I have next to you. <clears throat> okay, Vex, you changed a lot this year. Oh, I didn't bring my robot. Uh, I have a Vex U robot, but I'll bring it off this afternoon. You probably get it. Uh, John, they should have it in the lab. Um, so. VEXU changed a lot this year. Uh, we we had some VEXU specific sessions scheduled for the conference, but they had really low signups, so I'm just gonna cover it real quick here. Um, we went back to two robots, 15 and 24 inches. Um, they must use V5. With that, they get unlimited motors. You're basically limited by the battery. Um, you, with you, with 20 motors, your battery's only gonna last like 45 seconds. Um, and so yeah, so teams will figure that out. Um, and then uh, you are allowed to use other VEX parts, and this is kind of the biggest transition. Other VEX parts or, pre, or your own fabricated parts. Um, what this means is, is for those who are familiar with the FRC side of things, we do have the whole VEX Pro line of products. We wanted to get those products available for use in the VEX competition as well. Um, and so this expands it out to a lot of different wheels, different metal structural pieces, different uh, higher um, durability gears, um, just a ton of stuff. And we actually have quite a few products that we're going to be uh, availing later this year um, that, that will play into this as well. Um, so we're really excited about opening this up. And then the other half of it as well is the, is the fabrication side. So we want to see 3D printed robots, we want to see Lexan router, router cut uh, mechanisms, we want to see sheet metal punched robots, like VEXU robots, maybe not this year, but probably in the next year or two, um, will start looking not like VEX robots that you're used to. Um, and we're really excited to see. And the, really the reason for this change 
is because this was actually a change brought on by feedback from universities, from VEXU teams. Um, a lot of VEXU teams said, we're, we're playing the same thing as the, the high school kids. Like, where's the additional challenge? Where's the, where, I have all this $100,000 machine shop at my disposal and then like, I don't get to use any of it. Uh, and also from the universities themselves. This helps elevate VEXU as a prestigious competition in the university's eyes. Because now you're not just building with erector toys, you're building with you know, CNC uh, routed parts and all that. Yeah, so these were some robots that we had the interns build up. Yeah, but I, I like that one more even because it shows, like these are possible VEXU robots. They look nothing like what you're used to. VersaFrame chassis, eight inch uh, wheels, different tread types. Um, and we'll have these up there, you can come check them out. Uh, yeah, the little guy runs, the big guy's really close to running. Uh, but you'll see different gearboxes, different wheels, all sorts of fun stuff. So really excited about this change. Uh, oh, and the expansion limits. So I talked about the expansion limits for, VEC, for VRC. They still apply in VEXU, they're just scaled to the size of the robot. So the 15 inch robot has to come back down to 15. The 24 inch robot has to come back down to 24. Both of them can only expand to 36 horizontally, uh, which limits the 24 inch robot a little bit, Excuse me. which is good because these things could start getting crazy. <laughs> so, so that's all I had prepared. Uh, any general overall questions, uh, especially on the stuff I started covering at the end? And, and like Dan's mentioned, uh, I'll also be at the lunches and the dinners, so if you want to just put them on Q&A cards, I'll be there as well. So he asked about dual credit students or dual enrolled students. Um, this has been a topic uh, for a few years. This year it's in the manual. Um, dual enrolled students are not eligible to be VEXU students. Uh, they must be matriculated individuals. They must have undergone a high school graduation ceremony. Yes. This, there are members of the GEC that were on uh, VXU teams when they were in high school, and you know, so it's, it's a hot topic, but that's what we've decided.